Hey everyone, and welcome to episode 18 of Death Space Filling the Void. Starting season three. It's very exciting for me. Just wrapped season two of my other podcast called That Gives Me Anxiety. Feel free to go check that show out. Each episode is a different thing that causes anxiety or fear. And we talk about it, laugh about it, and then try to find ways to make that thing easier or to improve mental health overall which i often have psychologists on and 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 it, it's a lot of fun to make so yeah definitely go check that out but i'm also excited because up until now all of the episodes i recorded the interviews at least were recorded while i was living in new york in brooklyn and i moved to charleston in late march <laughs> so i had what is that seven months of content just built up yeah, I mean, that was, that felt that felt pent up, and, and I wanted to get all that out there. But while that was posting, I, I learned a lot about both of the shows, and I wanted to start putting what I learned into practice. And so this whole season, of which I currently have 12 episodes ready, I think this season is going to be 14 episodes. Don't hold me to it. It could be longer. Got a few other irons in the fire there. Are all recorded here in Charleston and, and somewhat recently. So I'm excited to share it all with you. Other than that gives me anxiety rolling out. Fantastic summer down here. Just been going to Solomon's Island, downtown. My parents came to visit. Just trying to cram two and a half months of news in 13 seconds. <laughs> but yeah, performing a lot of improv here at Theater 99 in downtown Charleston. Playing beer league hockey. Really just trying to survive that. You know, 35 now, Matt. Not what I once was. And I'm starting to think that what I once was wasn't that great either. <laughs> but we're kicking off with a fantastic episode here. I interviewed Reverend Allison Lee Schudinger, who's a interfaith minister, a photographer, and a professor at the New School in design and, and sustainable design. Allison had a near-death experience and is also a covid long hauler, meaning someone who is experiencing side effects of, of having COVID for, I think she explained 18 months. She got it in March of 2020. So yeah, 17, 18 months. I mean, geez. But she also had had the interesting perspective of working in sustainable design. She saw and drew comparisons between being a COVID long hauler, having a near-death experience and climate change. And our efforts to, or what it will take to overcome the side effects of, of climate change. I know, it kind of sounds a little different, and that's what makes it exciting. So before we get to that interview, I want to remind you to, if you're liking the show, please remember to rate and review it, and to check the show out on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube. Well, I'm excited to be back here. I'm excited to be doing season three. If you have an idea for this podcast or if that gives me anxiety, definitely reach out on, on all the social. And thank you so much for listening and enjoying. Joining me now on the podcast is Allison Schuttinger, who is a professor who is a professor of sustained systems at Parsons University. You know, I always have an issue with the intro. I don't know what that is, but it's the only part that's formal. The rest is just human to human. But thank you so much for, for joining me. Of course. Yeah. Thank you for for taking my offer and engaging in conversation with me. Of course. Yes. Yeah, so we connected over Instagram, I believe it was, on, on, on social. You liked an image I posted. Mm, yeah. Oddly enough. <laughs> and then I sent you a message and I, I was really impressed by the few clips I watched with the previous speakers you had on and the content and the realness of the conversation. So yeah, I, I wanted to reach out and, and have a conversation with you. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for doing so. Yeah. I, I spend a lot of time on Instagram, especially for death space. I'm just curious how people are talking about death and, and, grief and, and stuff like that. And I read a lot of different posts. It's been really eye-opening. There is a lot of people doing really good work out there. So people, I'm, I'm out there on Instagram, I'm reading. <laughs> so I, I guess we should start by you telling us a little bit about yourself. Yeah. So I, I teach sustainable systems. So you got the title mainly correct, sustainable systems at Parsons School of Design at the New School. And I love it. It allows me to be a student and continually be immersed in a very live, organic, 
constantly evolving subject, which is how we relate to ourselves, each other, and the planet, and how we can make better systems, designs, stuff, and even ideologies that support that stuff. Well, I'm curious. So that we can more just and sustainable life in future. Yeah. We, we had a previous conversation about, just to connect before we did this actual interview, and you described how you teach a class where design can be boiled down to certain principles, whether it be designing a, like a city sh- shitty city block or a logo. And, and you just added, I guess, how we relate to ourselves and, and, and how much of our lives is, is attributed to good or bad design. So I'm curious if you can give us a little taste of, of what are some good design principles. The, the course, we start with principles of systems thinking and of education for sustainability. So within education for sustainability, that's what I've been trained in. And there are some very basic enduring understandings or, or kind of eco commitments or principles. Um, there's a few different labels for them. And one of them is healthy systems have limits. Uh, have limits. That This is a very basic common law. It's a physical law. It's a natural law. It's also even a psychological law. Um, it's a spiritual law. We can apply it in a lot of different ways. So systems thinking really allows us to see the parts that make up a whole in a system and then even nested systems within other systems and kind of zoom out and be able to begin to see a web and a diagram of how ecology relates to social structures, relates to design, relates to economy, relates to public health. So we, we start with just those, those principles, healthy systems have limits, diversity makes life possible. This is also a natural law. We're all in this together. These are very basic common sense things. No, none of this is groundbreaking, but it, they're really like the cornerstones in being able to begin thinking relationally and in interdependently, emergently on a dimensional and evolutionary uh, way so that the class itself, though it's medium is design, is really a way of thinking and a way of being in the world. That all sounds so incredibly interesting. And it's so true, right? Whether it be systems are all in an, some kind of balance, whether it be the atmosphere or whether there are too many coffee shops in Brooklyn or too many wolves means too little deer. We're all in this complete balance that's so delicate. Yeah. We are essentially one organism. Right. Uh, many parts to one larger organism. Which always makes me think about whether the earth itself could be deemed an organism because it has all these systems. It has, mm-hmm. you know, an internal structure and, and everything everything is tied together. Which is which is a nice feeling. It is. It is. Yeah. There there's an element uh, of the unexplainable within the science. So I, I think that's a really exciting piece. It's a really interesting piece. It's why I studied to be an interfaith minister, uh, because I don't believe we can have separate conversations that I believe science and spirit work together. And, and then it's also greatly influenced my personal life and part of why I reached out to you with a personal experience uh, in relation to death. But all of these things are very much related. I do want, of course, want to get to yeah. the near death experience and, and thank you for, for being open and, and sharing this with, with everyone. But I am curious about the interfaith minister aspect of, of your life. I don't, I don't even know where to begin really. It, it, so it's, I'll let you explain why I, I just, I, I don't fully know what that means. And I'm, I'm curious to hear more about it. Yeah. And I don't think there's one, one set definition, at least not for me. I, I came to this from a place of desperation. I was working full time as a sustainability coach in an elementary school here in Greenpoint, Brooklyn. Uh, and it was the ideal on the paper job that I wanted doing all of this incredible on paper work, but it wasn't enough for me. So the recycling and the gardens, I I wanted to go deeper. Something felt like it was missing, that we were just scratching the surface and even that was difficult. And that if we didn't reach this this deeper, potentially moral or like value or more implicit, some maybe what might call it spiritual level, that we, we might not be able to influence or inspire people to shift or change behaviors or change cultures, mm-hmm. AKA getting people to recycle properly, which is something that's been in place for decades and is still really difficult. 
So, so I was doing this job, not feeling fully satisfied, knowing that I needed more. I, through a very random series of emails and websites and research, found a workshop on shamanism. And that was held at a place called, it was just a one day, held at a place called One Spirit Learning Alliance. I was then reintroduced to a, a very deep intimate relationship I feel with nature and have my whole life and a few months went by I went back to the swing of things and then I remembered that place and re-looked into it One Spirit Learning Alliance and saw that they had a counseling interspiritual counseling program and an interfaith seminary program so I signed up actually for the interspiritual counseling my background and my master's is in psychology and with a focus on neuroscience and behavior change and positive psychology, but they required a foundation year in seminary. And I said, seminary? Like, that's not for me. Mm -hmm. um, I associated it with Christianity or, or just with an institutionalized religion. I went to the intro workshop and I was completely blown away by the deans, their facilitation, the space, the openness. There was no preaching. There was no, you have to be a certain way or think a certain way or believe in something. And before I knew it, I was two years later graduating from the Interfaith Seminary. Um, cool. So what it means to me and what we explored within that first year was 12 of some of the world's largest faith traditions, one a month. Uh, we really devoted ourselves to a different faith and practice beyond Abrahamic traditions. And then the second year was really a practicum. But that this was all just kind of one layer of it because there was a much more deeper kind of transformational layer uh, that we all went through as peers and students. So it was a very deeply personal and transformational process. That sounds so interesting. So it, it's kind of like a work study program where you get to work with HR for three months and product for three months, but in the sense that you're getting, you're, you're diving into religions or, or ways of thinking or being. Yeah, a little bit. We heard from different experts and practitioners once once a month. The curriculum was very rigorous. It is the equivalent of a master's program, so two oh, wow. years intensely. We had consistent homework. We made wedding ceremonies and funerals and, and various types of rituals and blessings. So it was very, very intense. And my first uh, after graduation kind of ministry and service was in relation to nature and at a community garden. So the way that this is applied beyond graduation is a whole variety of ways. There, there's no one way. Sure, just like any other degree, right? My, my yeah. interpersonal communication degree could be used to create a podcast about death, or you could be become a banker or open a restaurant. So yeah, correct me if I'm wrong, and, and I'm always interested in the word spirituality or when you were describing i there was a i picked up a little bit of sense of hesitancy to use that word now i i, I found that with people who are in science and i've read a bunch of books on how to change your mind using like magic mushrooms and stuff like that and there is this hesitation seemingly to use the word spirituality or to give that enough weight i'm curious what are your thoughts on 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 that word yeah, I think there's a lot of words. Love, mystery, spirit, the unexplainable, awe, wonder. And I try to be as flexible and as open as possible, knowing that some people have been greatly wounded from, from certain religious institutions or maybe in their own personal lives. So I, I, I'm careful. I'm cautious around that. But, and, I should <laughs> say, and I am really excited and I genuinely feel the need for including spirituality in our conversations, in our lives. It isn't not there. And I, I especially think in relation to the natural world, which includes us. And I think it's a way of being that, that can help shape a, a more sustainable future. Uh, and it doesn't have to look any one way. It, it can just be, you can be an atheist and still believe in a, a certain wonder of how a, a ladybug looks and is, is so beautifully shaped and knows exactly what it's doing and what its role is in the world. Absolutely. So I think we just need a little bit more flexibility out of everyone generally in this world, right? That would be a little bit easier if we could all bend a little bit. It, cre it creates a space for empathy. 
Yeah, and adaptability is is one of those characteristics of the natural world. So we we learn we learn from nature, and agility and adaptability are features, and we see that. And I think we forget we have that within us. I I, I see that in the pandemic. We we have we've shifted. We've done a lot of things differently. We've come to agreements. It's not perfect. It's far from perfect, but but it shows our capabilities. That's a great point. We definitely forget that. Yeah. Um, all too often. Well, I, I want to go back and, and talk about your near-death experience. Can yeah. you tell us a little bit about that? I don't want to steal your story. Oh, no. this uh, And I think it relates to the theme that we've already kind of discussed, and it definitely helped influence the spiritual relationship I feel in relation to the world and beings around me. And so about 15 years ago, when I was 19, I had a subarachnoid hemorrhage that was the result of multiple aneurysms rupturing inside what's called an AVM, an atrial venous malformation. On an MRI, it looks like a cluster of veins, like a hairball, and it was inside my left cerebellum, so the little brain. And they, th there's, there's really not a lot of known consensus of what causes AVMs, this abnormality. They, they assume it's congenital. And within that abnormality, I had aneurysms we didn't know about, and then they ruptured, causing a subarachnoid hemorrhage. An aneurysm is, is what exactly? Because I think it's like a blockage in your brain, but that's a stroke. So I, I, I want to make sure I have the right thing. So a, a hemorrhage is a type of stroke. Okay. And an aneurysm can be a clot or a thinness of the vein. And I had the thinness which, which we didn't see on the MRI. So there were multiple um, places that were so thin that they ruptured um, actually during, an, during a, a routine medical procedure. So I was wow. in the best hands possible when the hemorrhage happened. Oh my goodness. I was just about to ask where you were, right? Were you jogging or, or, or yeah, I, I suspected there would be some sort of like elevated heart rate, but this just happened while you were getting routine care? Well, so I, I, I signed up for brain surgery because I, uh, they wanted to remove it. First, we were going to radiate it, and then I got a very good feeling by a very special doctor, Dr. Solomon, and I said, nope, I want him to be my brain surgeon. Mm -hmm. I want to have this removed. And again, they told me this was non-symptomatic, that they're just removing it to be cautious in case it does hemorrhage. Got it. So we thought this was just like mm, abnormality, no big deal. But for years, I had symptoms of lightheadedness, dizziness, numbness in my extremities. And when I would elevate my heart rate and my blood pressure would go up, I would start to feel faint. So I would lose hearing. I'd see spots. This would happen maybe after 20 minutes of dancing. I'm a teenager and I have high energy and I love dancing still to this day. So that was very difficult. There were many, many cases where I got used to lying on the ground at a party and people just got familiar with that. Oh my goodness. <laughs> so so we, we signed up to have it removed still under the assumption that these symptoms were unrelated to that and then the hemorrhage happened. The hemorrhage could have happened if I were to push myself at any one of those other times, probably, likely, oh we don't goodness. really know. Yeah, so, right. so it's kind of incredible that it happened in the hands of uh, specialists who are able to what's called embolize it immediately. They stopped it with blood. They could see blood spreading on the screen and they, they embolized it. That's great. I also love how you described, uh, you know, I got a good feeling from this brain surgeon. That feels good. That feels good. That must have been a very yes. important. I'm very particular about the coffee shop I go to based on my interaction. So I, it's good to have a brain surgeon that you're like, I'm into this guy. This guy, this guy knows what he's doing. It's kind of, it's like really precious territory there. Yeah. So you have to feel good about the person. Right. Absolutely. So then describe what happens at that moment when, when it, when you do have this aneurysm. Right, so I wasn't functioning. They embolized as soon as they could, so they were trying to stop the blood flow, but even within a matter of seconds, blood has already started spreading. I've had an excessive amount of cerebral spinal fluid, which is also what's released to help protect, from my understanding, protect your brain. Mm -hmm. So the amount of the cerebral spinal fluid in blood is so much pressure that I wasn't functioning properly. So I was not awake. I was not conscious during this time. Mm -hmm. Doctors, therefore, went out, saw my family. I have no idea what their faces looked like in that moment. They then, I, I'm not even sure how long of a time period they gave it before they 
drilled a, a hole in my skull and then put a catheter inside to alleviate the pressure on what's called a brain splint, like a shunt. And that the, the catheter and the tube then went to literally like a bag that was filled. It almost looked like Kool-Aid next to my head. That's what I was told. Oh my God. And that, that was connected for, I believe, almost nine days. So it was, I was in ICU for nine days and I believe I was tied to that for that entire period. So it was a fair amount of blood and cerebral spinal fluid. Oh my God. And so you asked what the feeling was like. So initially, right, I'm not awake. Then I returned to functioning. And I know I said this over the phone to you, but the, the sensation was when I did wake up and I could, again, barely open my eyes, everything was bright. There's immense amount of pain, but it did feel like I was in the hands of something powerful and that I didn't have to fight anymore. So it, it felt for months, even years beforehand, especially going to series of doctors with divorced parents arguing over which doctor is better, panic attacks in parking lots. You know, it was a real struggle trying to figure out what's going on with me. I thought I was crazy. I thought I was crazy for the dizziness and the headaches. And I had no idea what happened. No one told me yet that I had a hemorrhage. I thought I was still having the surgery. Um, right, days before, you, you're probably just thinking it's still days ago that you went in for that other surgery. Yeah, it, it's just an immense amount of pain, but pain that's so sharp and so intense that it's almost numbing. It, 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 it's, it brought me to another level. It's, there's, no, there's no other job I had to do but to surrender. And I was strapped down at a certain point because I wasn't able to move. So there was a confinement. I couldn't drink water. I had to soak on a sponge, which is common after things like this because they don't want you to choke. So yeah, just an, a, a total surrender. That's, that's what I can say well, about the immediate feeling. I'm sure a lot of people that are listening just had like a like moment with you describing this, this higher power. Like, how does that feel that throughout your body? Where, how do you, how do you feel that sensation? It's hard to recall in the exact moment when it happened. It felt like if I had died and, and I think I said this to you over the phone as well, it felt like if I had died, this is how people would respond. It almost felt like a dream. And because everything was so bright and so overstimulating and I could barely open my eyes. There was a bright light involved. I think it's, it, it, I don't know, you feel it in, throughout your whole body because it's, a, it's, a, it's like a non-feeling feeling. You kind of transcend the pain because you don't really have any other option. You're just there. My only job was to be there. I didn't have to do anything. I didn't have to facilitate anything. Um, and it had felt like that for a long time. So in many ways, it was a relief. Well, I'm so, I'm, yeah, I'm so happy to, to hear that you had this moment of peace. How would you, I'm not like trying to force it down any particular avenue, but how would you describe where this was coming from? Because I could feel I, or I can understand some people saying like within themselves, they just sort of came to a, a, some sort of acceptance, but this seems like it's coming from an exterior source. So I, I'm curious to hear what you would, how you felt or where, where that was coming from. Yeah, I, I'd say since I was a child, I felt like I had a, an intimate conversation with something. I, I, I didn't know what to name it. When I would journal, I would write you. I just call that power or that being you. Then I grew to call it nature, but I did, I, I have always felt like I am in an intimate conversation with some, some being and that I'm not alone. So that has That's felt right. That's great. Sorry? Oh, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. I just oh. had the initial reaction of like, that's so comforting. That's kind of wonderful because a lot of people that are afraid of death are uh, fearful of the, the loneliness aspect of it, I, I think. Yeah, and this, so I, I, I don't think I was afraid necessarily, but this brought it to a whole other level uh, and expanded something even more. I would say that it felt very embodied and uh, what's another good descriptive word? Because you're asking where, where did it feel like it was coming from? And I don't think it was any one place. I really feel like it was a relationship. Mm. 
So, and it was just like omnipresent. Took, yeah, and it took my participation. It took my willingness to surrender. It took my belief in something and it took, I mean, it took a lot. It took 24 seven nurse care. It took nine IVs and a bunch of technology and some drugs. It took incredible precise hands of the neurosurgeon as an assistance. It took family members reaching out to loved ones and my dad reaching out to a native American shaman who he was connected. I mean, there were so many things at hand. Mm. So it was not, I wasn't the only one there. My sister's reaching out through Facebook and sending messages to my friends. Of course, I don't know about this in the moment, but this was happening and I learned about it later. I think it's a great example and to take this to just beyond my personal experience and to others, that I think it's a great example of how capable we are of responding in chaos and in emergency. And I believe we are in a pretty consistent state of emergency. We're obviously in a global pandemic, COVID, that involves like public health and the economy and so many layers. But we're also in zoom out even larger and with climate change and global warming um, in a much more epidemic that's, um, that's beyond a vaccinated virus. I think my very small personal experience shows the capability of how we respond in a state of emergency. And I felt that capability. I felt the hands around me. It's not just this like God from above. It was real tangible people. It's, it's technology. It's, you know, it's all of these elements, things we've created, and also the way we responded in the moment. I, I think, yeah, I, I think there's a lot to that. And I think it's an energy that we can tap into uh, more consistently, especially in response to the climate crisis. Yeah. And that's definitely something I, we're going to touch upon. I remember the stress I felt having to switch from Final Cut Pro to Premiere. They're both video editing software. It could be daunting to switch or have to continuously learn a new program. In fact, I learned Premiere by telling a company that I knew Premiere when I didn't. And I just figured it out and, and really threw myself into the pool to make sure I knew it because I knew I needed to know it. So learning software is very important, especially if you lied and need to catch up. Today's episode is brought to you by My Software Tutor. Are your Excel skills optimized for your current job? Do you know the basics but need to learn more? My Software Tutor offers three levels of real-time Zoom-based courses with a live instructor. Yeah, I need a live instructor. There's a lot of video tutorials out there, but having someone ask questions feels a lot better, a lot easier. They all deliver practical, functional business skills in a friendly, supportive environment. These courses will increase your marketability, whether you're an employee, job seeker, consultant, or contractor. Register at MySoftwareTutor.com and use the promo code POD20 to save 20% off all registrations. Today's episode is also brought to you by The Cardist. This is a service that basically helps you mail cards with a special message on the inside. They help you write that. That's amazing because... Jamie's always laughing at me because I usually just write the person's name, dear so-and-so, and at the end, just write love, Pat and Jamie. Just when you get to writing the card, you feel so put on the spot. I'm pretty expressive with how I feel in, in my relationship with my friends or, or with my family. So, yeah, it's also hilarious to be admitting that I feel like I'm really put on the spot and couldn't think of anything to say. Eight years of improv training down the drain. (laughs) But with so many birthdays, there's no time to shop for cards, write the cards, and buy the stamps. Now you can do it all right where you sit, because the Cardist Studio does it for you. That's great. I want more things where people do it for you. Make your life easier. Introducing a writing specialist for the message inside your greeting cards. The Cardist Studio creates your message, writes it in the card, and mails it for you. The post office, one th- one tough thing when I used to live in Brooklyn was the, the lines at the post office. Insane. South Carolina, it's just, you walk right in, you walk right out. The most recent man who helped me was like smiling at me. 
<laughs> so he's the post office just being like, get out of here. We have more people to get in. Don't you see the line? Hurry up. All you do is pick the card and tell why you're sending it. No more errands. No more anxiety. For a message from your heart, but not your hands. Sit back and just enjoy your relationships. TheCardistudio.com. Thoughtful. Just got easy. And you can use the promo code DEATHPOD for 10% off all orders. When you explain this to your family, when you explain there was this source of energy that was asking you to surrender and and that you were in good hands, uh, how did they react? What did they take from that? Well, so my sister became a nurse practitioner, a primary care provider. And in the hospital, she was very much my nurse. She's, she, this is part of who she is. She then became a, an official primary care provider. So she has a very doctor mindset. She's a very efficient, pragmatic mindset. So she's less interested in the spiritual stuff. Uh, <laughs> but there's spirit even within that. And she very much had her role in her response. And for at least five years, I think even more, my sister would come to New York, she lives in Boston, and we would celebrate the anniversary every year. And we'd go to Columbia Presbyterian, we'd eat the shitty scones that my sister had to eat every <laughs> breakfast when I was in ICU. We visited all the spots where she napped in, like just, we, we made a ritual out wow. of it, um, which was really beautiful. We saw nurses again. So that, and still every year, I kind of honor that, that day. My dad, who believes that it was definitely a spiritual experience, and so does my mom. Everyone kind of has their own unique take on it, I think. And I think that moment, it's very hard to know for me what it was like for them on the other side, seeing, seeing that. I know, I, I, I think it was extremely traumatic for my parents, because mm -hmm. why wouldn't it be? Um, so. Yeah, I think they, they definitely accept it. I think they get it. And yeah. they know me, so. <laughs> well, great. Well, fast forward to the pandemic. Unfortunately, you contracted COVID. Tell me, how did, how did it feel? Yeah, so when I first got COVID in March 2020, it was pretty intense, pretty severe for what I, I'm considered young and healthy. And we didn't think I had a precondition, though, again, and I'll say more about this, we're learning that there is a relationship between traumatic brain injury and uh, neurological symptoms reoccurring with COVID. But initially when I got it, it was, it was very intense. The dizziness was really bad. It felt like a sumo wrestler was sitting on my chest. It was difficult breathing, but not to the point where I needed to be in a hospital. And it was so soon and I'm young and healthy that there was no need. There was nothing for me to do. Uh, when I first zoomed with a doctor, I could barely lift my head, but I wasn't turning blue. So that was essentially the protocol. You turn blue or you have diabetes or you have a heart condition, then you go to the hospital. Well, especially Otherwise, in March of 2020 right. in New York City, the, every hospital bed right was all hands on deck right that's when they had the the ship here they had the javits center there's so much confusion yep. and oh my just such a hard time so i'm sorry that must have been extremely scary we i feel like we have a lot more of an understanding of covid now not entirely but that must have been such a scary time for many reasons yeah and i was lucky enough to to be with my boyfriend and some and some roommates, so I wasn't completely alone. The first two months were really severe. I was part of a Mount Sinai Precision Recovery Program. I tracked my symptoms every day. And then we thought I was, I was fine after a week or so of like no symptoms. So I stopped. Two months? I'm sorry, I, I just wanted to make sure you had symptoms for two months. Uh, severe nothing. symptoms like oh my goodness pretty intense ones and then we thought I was fine and that I could maybe like start doing some exercise a little bit here and there and mind you I was doing everything I was doing breathing exercises 5,000 dose or 5,000 milligrams of vitamin c I was boiling oranges and inhaling vapors I was eating orange rinds I was doing the natural stuff the like my, my stuff my sister's telling me to do who's you know as you know a doctor so I was trying everything I was sleeping 12 hours I would melt at about 5 p.m. and 
literally felt like ice cream. Like you couldn't, you couldn't lift me if you had to. Oh, wow. And then again, we thought everything was cool, but symptoms lingered and continued about six months after March, 2020. I had a very intense vertigo episode, just a block down when I was walking my dog. I sat outside a bench, sipping a latte, and suddenly out of nowhere, I could not see straight. I didn't know what direction was what, and oh I, couldn't, I couldn't stand. I had to have a friend come pick me up. Yeah, it's not a fun feeling. Vertigo is really, really disorienting. I, I saw a neurologist. Um, nothing structurally is wrong with my brain. There's no other hemorrhage or no other brain abnormality. So I've seen a bunch of doctors since because symptoms have continued. It's now been 17 months since March 2020. And I have consistent dizziness, lightheadedness, headaches, disorientation, weird things of like a metallic taste in my mouth. So it's not like I've lost taste, but it kind of tastes like metal. Tiredness, of course, fatigue. I have to pretty much shift my activity about every two hours. Uh, so I have to break it with maybe rest or which helps that I primarily work from home now, although that's going to shift a little bit. Uh, brain puzzles. <laughs> I've, I've been recommended by physical therapists that I do brain puzzles because they can see, oddly enough, and this kind of relates to the traumatic brain injury, to the hemorrhage, that I have sometimes nystagmus, which is rapid eye movement in especially my right eye and my physical therapist and energy chiropractor has noted that my right side of the body has trouble communicating with the left side of my brain. So for 15 years, we thought it was, hey, Ali, it's a miracle. You survived this hemorrhage, no symptoms, you're great. And intermittently in that time when I would get super sick, some of that dizziness would come back. And now COVID has brought a lot of that back. Oddly enough, I have similar symptoms than when I, when I was in the hospital. So it's a very strange kind of experience, and yeah. I'm trying to, to find the right rehab uh, and the right doctors to create a, a, an appropriate treatment program. Well, my goodness, I, I'm sorry that that all must weigh on you. So I, I do want to get to why this might be happening, if, if there is anything. Uh, but before that, being a COVID long hauler, as, as I believe people are referring to cases such as yours what's what does that feel like mentally what knowing initially two months of heavy symptoms and now 17 months of significant symptoms how, how does that play out in your mind definitely anxiety and loneliness for i'd say off and on throughout those 17 months part of me about maybe two two three months ago i can't i don't know what time it is after reading some books about uh, neuroplasticity and the brain's way of healing itself. It's an incredible book. I highly recommend it. And looking into some other resources and kind of just my own meditation, it, it allowed me to come to accept similarly, like in the hospital, of a, a place of surrender and a place of acceptance. Okay, this is, this is my reality right now. I don't know all the answers. Doctors don't know all the answers. I've had a neurologist tell me point blank, there's nothing to do about your symptoms period. Oh my gosh. She said, you've had a hemorrhage in the motor coordination in the balanced part of your brain. You will always have dizziness. And I had to look her in the eye and say, no, I don't believe that's true. I believe there's resilience in the brain, just as there's resilience in the natural world. And we have to tap into that plasticity. I've intentionally tried to alleviate the emotional anxiety because that's energy taxing in and of itself. Mm -hmm. I can't afford to question it anymore. I can't afford to doubt my own symptoms. It is, it just is. And it's helped to have a partner mirror that. It's helped to have uh, people in my life, close friends who have had chronic conditions like chronic fatigue who are, it's very similar to COVID. So I have a lot of close, close people in my life that help remind me I'm not alone, which is very, very important. And also just a level of acceptance of like, all right, this is it right now and we have to move forward. In fact, Maybe the why doesn't matter so much. And, and it's the response and how we respond to this stress right now. And it also makes me think of climate change and how we respond. Because we could sit here and argue all day long if this hurricane is a cause of climate change or that wildfire is a cause of climate change or what's this and what that. 
And I think we lose a lot of energy by arguing versus creating alternative solutions that are a win-win no matter what and just treat the immediate, the, treat the symptoms in a holistic manner. It's important to know the etiology of why something exists. And also there's a release of, I'm not gonna wait around for the answer. We, we don't have time. I don't have time and the planet doesn't have time. You know what I mean? Absolutely. We have, we have to do a little bit of both. We have, the why starts coming when we start responding and we start engaging. That's true. The why, the why could get worse in relation to, to climate change. And, and as it relates to your symptoms, I mean, that's such a beautiful way of, of, of approaching or tackling it. It's like, it is. I, I love that sense of like, I don't, I almost don't care why. Uh, not to put words in your mouth, but I, it's happening. And, and all right, so what do we do now? Right. Right. Uh, and, and that is exactly. Yes, I, I've heard reports of people talking about, you know, an individual hurricane can't be attributed or, or we sometimes argue over. OK, so a hurricane on just came through New York. Was that did that happen because of climate change or is it just like the atmospheric conditions were right? It doesn't matter. The point is, there are larger storms, rising seas. Uh, large, you know, we're, we continue to admit. So, if that one part of the problem wasn't caused by it, it doesn't matter. There's, there's still the aggregate to look at, and the aggregate is is important. Yeah, and it's about tracking those patterns and and connecting those dots. And that's what back to the sustainable systems class and and tools of a systems thinker is you, you are a whole job is kind of connecting dots mm -hmm. and thinking in systems and thinking in patterns, thinking in relationships. And, and therefore the pressure and the significance doesn't fall on any one part or any one incidence or any one circumstance. And we zoom out and we see this pattern, we see the bigger picture and we're like, all right, what makes sense? What makes sense is I get rehab. What makes sense is we rehabilitate our, our planet and our way of thinking. You know, these things I feel are very much related. In some ways, I think this experience as a COVID long hauler with traumatic brain injury history has allowed a more intimate window into how I feel the earth must feel. I'm more sensitive to stimuli and to sound and to light. I can't ride the subways with the screeching. I've feel I'm doing this. You see me in the city and this is how I look. And that's only if I have to for work or for doctor's appointments. So my, my life has shrunk. Um, and yet it's also expanded. My relationships have, have gotten deeper. Um, I'm not running around as much. Uh, I'm not chasing things. I, I cook more. I, I invest in my one local vegan cafe and I know the baristas and mm -hmm. we it just, and I get my farm share and I drop off my compost and some of these things I did beforehand. And now they're really meaningful because it feels my body literally has limits and, I, and so does the planet. But it's very easy to disregard the planet if we're running around like I did in my 20s, traveling everywhere. And that's great. And I learned a lot from that. And now it's like, I care about my 10 blocks and, mm -hmm. and this is what I'm capable of holding. And and I feel a lot better when I am able to work within this limited range. Because all, all systems and balance have limits. Yes. 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 <laughs> Who did you are? Yes. Well, you kind of answered the, the big question that I had is, is how does a, a near-death experience and a COVID long haul relate to climate change? Uh, I don't know if there was something else you wanted to add to that, but yeah, I feel like you did do a very good job of, of tying the two together. Yeah, I'll just say, I think, I think we're in a near-death situation. It might be a little bit longer than literally seconds when someone doesn't start functioning because blood has spread in the brain, but blood is spreading in the planet, essentially, and the, ha the planet is on fire, and it is a state of emergency. Uh, it's not often so physical right in our front, and yet it is. We're, we're seeing these changes. So I, I do believe there, the metaphor is quite literal, that we're in a, 
in a state of emergency and we don't really know how our species will survive unless we respond appropriately. And there's more than enough science to show that and there's more than enough different disciplines of people that have provided that and indigenous people who have prophesized it for centuries. So this isn't new, but we really are coming up to a breaking point. It, it, it has been breaking, it's, it's breaking. It feels like how I did when I was 18 and the symptoms were getting worse and worse and worse and I was pushing, I was pushing pressure on those aneurysms, right? Until they phew, ruptured. And I think the pandemic is, is kind of a metaphor maybe for that rupture. We, we've, we've ruptured, we've paused capitalism for, for a moment <laughs> in many ways. A wildlife grew back. We saw increases of many different species because of our less consumptive patterns, just pausing from a pandemic. No, we don't want to be in a constant state of a pandemic, but I think there's a lot of benefits and a lot of lessons to learn from this time. And it feels very embodied as a, as a long hauler. And I know others probably agree. I'm not alone in this. And definitely for people with chronic illness who have had it much longer than COVID, they're much more sensitive to their surroundings. And I, Kate Knopf is, a, is an author who writes about chronic, or chronic fatigue syndrome, and she really believes that illness is a transformational process and that there's an alchemy to illness. And I do believe that illness is an innovation. It's, it's, it's a window, you know, something's not working. It is, it's our body telling us something. It's the body of the planet responding with these more severe natural disasters. It is telling us in all of its ways, enough, enough. Right, that's a great metaphor. You described going back to your near-death experience. You said you kind of shook off the word fear or saying you were, you were afraid. Do you have any advice for someone who might be going through or, or a near-death near experience? Or I, I frankly was surprised to hear that you didn't describe yourself as afraid. Uh, I'm curious why that is. At 16, I was, well, actually, I have it right here. I was gifted this incredible book. It's been my Bible. It's called Women Who Run With the Wolves. As you okay. can see, it's quite worn. <laughs> it's been read um, a few times. Yeah. And I got to about page eight, and this was at my 16th birthday, and I said, that's it. Life is a web. I could die and it would be okay. So this- Just like that, huh? <laughs> I started a whole you remember a specific to help me moment. with my fear of death. But I'm, I'm, I'm not like saying like everyone should be afraid. I, I'm just so envious of your ability to be like, sure. I said that at 16. Uh -huh. Of course, it will be very, I think that that feeling will evolve in a lot of ways. But there was something of- life is a web. And I, I felt a part of that. Um, and it would be okay if I died. And then no one planned, I had no idea hemorrhage would happen. So it, it, it's, it's very different. I think if someone is intensely struggling from a chronic condition, and it has a terminal illness with a, you know, a countdown date, like there's so many different experiences. Mm -hmm. So I, th there's no blanket statement here. What's very interesting is, you know, the hemorrhage was a very like movie moment, people responding in emergency, people crowding my bed, and I didn't have to do anything. And it felt, it felt miraculous. And I didn't even know what was going on for most of it. And now I'm in a much more slow pace and it's chronic and, and, and it's mucky and no one really knows what's happening, even the best doctors, and we're trying to figure it out live together. And a little bit like climate change, we're trying to figure it out while it's happening at the same time. So they're a little bit different processes. And I will say I've definitely had moments and periods of crying, of rage, of I want to be dancing, I want to be doing these things that I can't be doing. Is this going to be forever? Am I going to be able to have kids? Am I going to be able to start the business I want to start? You know, all these things, I'm, they're, I'm not exempt from them. I, I think about them and have and can and will probably, again, maybe in two days, I'll be in a, a different feeling state. But, but fear doesn't feel like a part of that equation. Well, I'm, I'm so happy to hear that because I feel like fear is another detractor from the results you're seeking. Certainly can 
I, sorry, I would say I fear apathy. I fear apathy of the neurologist saying there's nothing to do. I fear mm -hmm. apathy of students being like, well, you know what? Everyone's told us this is our responsibility and I'm 19 and I don't know what the fuck to do with this world that we've been given. And everyone says we're going to die anyways. That scares me. Yeah, I understand. That apathy and the hopelessness that's what I feel I'm always up against. And it's not of my nature. I am a believer. I can't not believe. It's very difficult. <laughs> but that's what I'm up against. And sometimes it can feel discouraging and it can be disappointing. And I have to feel that. I have to let myself cry. I cry on a regular basis. It's, I think, a very, it's like a very important practice um, to just feel it and get it out. As a, as a new crier, <laughs> I, I can vouch for that, you know, growing Here's up. Here's to your man. new crying. Yeah. Yes. As a, as a man growing Good up. Good for you. Yeah, we're kind of taught, like, suck it up, you know, rub some dirt on it. But then when you grow up and I've been able to chart my, chart my own way and, and learn that that is an extremely helpful and useful tool. Yeah, you know good what? for you. That's great. Thank you. I want to go back to, you. so in the room... You know, what, what frustrates me about climate change, and this is exactly kind of what you were just saying, in, in the room where you have your aneurysm, everyone in the room is on board with the problem, we're solving it, and we're right. doing our part. With climate change, you know, half the people in the room are watching then, TV, you know? <laughs> it's right. like, we don't have all the Nurses that. in the bathroom, watching a TikTok video, Right. The doctor's like, I don't know. I don't believe in it. So maybe it does exist. Maybe it doesn't. I can't see it. Right. <laughs> I can't see it. I can't touch it. Right. So uh, it must not be real. <laughs> right. Wow. Yeah, that's very frustrating. But hopefully through education, through courses like yours, uh, I know I took a, a climate change class and I remember just being terrified and starts the journey there. So hopefully people will continue to educate themselves and it's something we can I'll do little things and those little things hopefully start to build momentum. Well, I, I'm curious if there's anything else related to your near death experience being a COVID long hauler or climate change itself and, and trying to solve that problem that, that you think we missed or, or that you would like to add? I guess I'll just add that it's, I think it's okay or I'm coming at a place where it's okay to have doubt and still believe. I think that's where I'm at, somewhere in between have doubt and still believe. I've seen it in my personal relationships. I've seen it in the relationship we have with each other and with our planet. And I think that in between place and not on one extreme or the other allows for Flexibility, another theme here, yeah. Right. And the reality, I'm, I'm not, I, I'm a big fan of not being like pseudoly optimistic. That's that's actually very irritating to me personally. <laughs> it's almost as irritating as the apathy, you know, and I think, right, are, are on one extreme uh, end of the spectrum and the other. And I don't know, my ministry feels like it's in between. I'm with the in-betweeners. Love it. Yeah. Little gray area for everybody. Thank you so much for your time. This has been a, a great chat and I, I hope that you feel better soon, as soon as possible. Thank you so much. It, it feels good to just talk about it. Thank you for making this space and for having conversation with me and allowing me to share my story. Of course, absolutely. Bye. Yeah, you wouldn't think there would be uh, such a comparison, you know, for between climate change and, and, and being a COVID long hauler or having a near-death experience. And oh my goodness, it's so interesting to hear people who have gone through a near-death experience what a scary moment, but also Allison feeling as though she was surrounded by something encouraging her to give in and that should be okay. I mean, that's extremely, extremely comforting. And I'm sure that something, you know, many people would call it many different things. And that's what makes it interesting to think about and to talk about. Well, like I said, we're going to have 12 to 14 episodes here of Death Space Filling the Void. I may roll some over. It just depends on scheduling and, and all this and that. But uh, there's a lot of very interesting interviews. I definitely teared up quite a bit while recording this season. Uh, it's extremely emotional. And, and I want to thank everyone that was a part of it for their honesty and, and openness and their enthusiasm. And I want to thank you for listening. Well, thank you very much. Have a great week. 
and I'll talk to you on Thursday.